Hey, the long top tens here. Humans are social animals, and one of the ways we bond with each other is by playing games. When an adult plays games and takes it seriously, it's considered a sport, alright? Now, the competitive nature of sport has gave it a crucial role in history. As a nation competes with another nation, an individual struggles to be the best. It is no wonder that the sports have changed the, the course of history more than once. So here are the 10 ways that sports have changed history, or say 10 events, or related things that had made history. So anyway, for this list, we used very um, awesome evidence to um, actually make these top 10s. So please do not consider any of these things fake. All right. Alright, we start off with number 10 at the Nika riots. We're all familiar with the riots that can be followed as a big sports match, but some people riots when their team loses and some when their team wins, however. But what we think of as riots are nothing compared to those in the HO world. For the Romans, horse racing was a big business. The richest sportsman who ever lived was Gas Apollius. Diacos, a Roman territor of the 2nd century AD, who immensed a fortune equivalent to billions of dollars today. There, were, there was also big money to be made from betting on the outcome of a race, and people became heavily invested in their teams. The Romans had teams of charioteers, the reds, whites, greens, and blues. By the time the capital moved to Constantinople, there were just two, green and blue. With only two choices, guys, the support of each team became more than just a passing fancy. It was a political statement and life choice. In AD 501, the Greens attacked the Blues and killed 3,000 people. In 532 AD, a tense situation exploded into revolt with Emperor Justin cracked down on this violence. Soon both sides were united in anger. They rioted chanted, Nika, or when, the usual cry in the Hippodrome. They began to burn the capital city down to the ground. They were, they were even crowned a rival emperor. The riot was only surprised when troops surrounded the Hippodrome and massacred those inside. Maybe 3,000 people were killed, one in ten the population at the time. Alright, we go on to number nine with ping pong diplomacy. Now, the Cold War split the world in literally two, the democracy and the communists, alright? Now, the communist countries presented a frosty wall to the West. In fact, China was one of the most imp impenetrable and inscrutable nations after it went communist. The Great Wall of China was finally breached by a ping ball ball. Time Magazine referred to it as the ping around, heard around the world, alright? While the U.S. ping pong team was competing in Japan in 1971, they received an invitation to tour China. This was the first invitation for Americans into communist China. It proved to be an opening that President Nixon made use of a year later. He sent Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to open the, res the relationship further. Within a week, or I should say within a year, Nixon himself was in China for a meeting. Now, Nixon even described his visit as the week that changed the world. Chinese Premier Ch um, Chao and Li said, Never before in history has a sport been used so efficiently as a tool of international diplomacy. So, that's pretty nice. Pretty awesome for those two people. Alright, <clears throat> we go on to number 8 with Henry VIII's wrestling match. International relations between European monarchies in the 16th century were always fraught, as well as the impersonal forces of trade. There within the whims of rulers shaping the world. How kings, well, got along could decide the fate of their own nations. Now, in 1520, King Henry VIII of England and King Francis I of France met to create a lasting peace between their two kingdoms. This meal was held near Clare. Solaris, Solaris, I should say. I don't think I said that right. I think I said right. That's located in France, guys. Now, so sumptuous were the preparations that made as known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold. Each king sought to outdo the other in generosity. Two monarchs met, embraced, and feast. 
They also jousted in the chivalric style of the time. Each was shown to their best advantage. That is until King Francis challenged Henry to a wrestling match. Both kings thought they were all that a prince should be. Unfortunately, Francis tripped and pinned Henry. Henry did not take this dishonor with quiet equanimity. The English felt that Francis had had used a typical treacherous French trick. All the expense of the meeting was wasted, as no treaty was signed, although not wholly due to the r rustling bow. It certainly did not foster a feeling of brotherhood between the royal duel. So think about it. Number 7. Turkey vs. Armenia Football, really soccer, match. There are few topics as likely to start an argument as discussing the Armenian genocide. To claim that the deaths of one and a half million Armenians during World War I was a genocide prep portrayed by the Turkish is controversial, especially to the Turkish, alright? So when Turkey was drawn to play against Armenia in qualifiers for the 2010 World Cup, it seemed like likely to be a tense match, although it was about 95 years ago uh, from 2010 to 1915. All right. Armenia had not established a diplomatic relationship with Turkey in the years after 1991, when Armenia gained its independence from the Soviet Union. What could have been a disaster became an international example of football diplomacy. All right. Armenian President Shar um, Shar Sharkyan invited Turkish President Ab Abdullah Gul to come to the game and sit beside him. Sharkyan said, what if our differences, there are certain cultural, humanitarian, and sports links that our people share, even with a closed border? There were even protests against the visit, but the match passed peacefully, even with a Turkish victory. Many credit the match with helping to pave the way for the return of full diplomatic relations, which soon followed afterward. Alright, next off is number 6 with World War I football, really soccer, ceasefire. All right. When World War I began, a common belief was that it will all be over by Christmas. The war dried off for four years, but no one knew what would happen at the beginning. Young men all over Europe signed up to fight, afraid that they would miss the big show if they didn't join quickly. By Christmas 1914, it was clear that the war had ground to a slow waltz of deeply entrenched armies facing each other across a field of mud. On Christmas Eve, soldiers heard the other side singing carols. Messages were shouted between trenches. On Christmas Day, the two sides met in no man's land. Gifts were exchanged, and famously, they played football. It's impossible to say what the effects of this temporary trust were. How many people survived that otherwise might be killed that day? What if one of the bullets not fired that day had been destined to strike a German soldier by the name of Hitler? How did the knowledge that their opponents were not monsters, but lads just like them, affect the soldiers? Frightened by the threat of troops not fighted as viciously as they were expected to, leaders on both sides took efforts to stop any repeat of this impromptu twice. Just remember that. Number five, kings and queens should stay away from horse riding. Now, um, so you get that horse riding is actually a sport for kings. All right, there was some about Sinan Strode, a powerful creature that has always attracted those who look, who look like to a uh, bureau. Next time you're in a galaxy, look at the number of monarchs painted in the saddle. Horse riding has been a pleasant pastime for most royals, but uh, they really should be careful. The list of those killed by horses is quite extensive. William III, King of England, died when his horse stumbled on a molehill. He fell and broke his collarbone. His health rapidly failed, and he died. His opponents raised a toast to the mole who killed their foe as the little gentleman in the black velvet waistcoat. Alexander III of Scotland rode his horse off a cliff in the dark and died on the beach below. Pope Urban VI had died an even more ignominious death. Instead of falling from a valid steed, he met his aunt in a tumble from a mule. 
Alright, other monarchs that mount equine ants include Prince Alfonso of Portugal, Frederick Augustus II of Saxony, Duke Geoffrey of Brittany, Isabella of Argonne, Leopold V of Austria, Louis IV of France, and William the Conqueror. The current polo loving princess of Britain should probably be wary about all this. Number four, Emily Davidson. All right, as shown in the um video on list verse, which I'm apparently running off of, the love affair between royalty and horses can be deadly. In 1913, the king's horses was also involved in the death, but this time it was not the king who died. The suffrage movement had been campaigning for women's rights, particularly the right to vote, since the late Victorian era. Their campaign involved marches, pamphlets, and speeches. In 1912, their actions became more direct, vandalism, arson, and bombs. At the 1913 Epson Derby, Emily Davison played her part in the suffrage movement. As the king's horses and more came toward her, she ran out in front of it. Her bows were unclear, but some believed that she wanted to commit suicide. Others believed that she was attempting to affix a flag to Anar. Either way, the horse collided with Davison, Flinging her through the air, the horse fell, the jockey was con concussed, and Davison died from her wounds four days later. As for the suffrage movement, uh, they gained a matar for their cause, who could be used as a rallying point. Hmm, interesting. Number three, Henry II Jalston. A king was supposed to be the living embodiment of his realm. A healthy and vigorous king represent a strong and powerful nation. People wanted their ruler to be a, just a warrior capable of defending them. To see as the ideal knight, kings jousted with each other, taking part in mock wars. Mock wars, however, could have some real consequences. In 1559, a tournament of a jousting was held in Paris to celebrate the signing of a pact between France and Spain. King Henry II of France took part in the contest despite being unstable. He was exhausted by the summer heat and the exercise. He carried on Jostin despite his courtier's best efforts. A lance struck the king in the face, splintering and stabbing him through the eye and penetrating his brain. The king managed to speak and was carried to his room, where doctors removed the splinters from his head and neck. The doctors hoped that the king would only lose an eye. They washed his wounds. They attempted to find out how extensive the injuries were by plunging the lance into decapitated heads. Despite their best efforts, the king died nine days later after being knocked down. Sad, sad. Number two, the modern day Olympics. The modern Olympics were an attempt to recreate the ancient games. Pierre de Corbeton, the founder of the modern day games, wanted to use sports as a way to bring about internationalism via the competition between nations. When the ancient Olympics took place in ancient Greece, a trust between the city-states was declared. No fine would take place while the games were on. Such a, were the noble intentions, and many Olympic games have changed the world. In the ancient Olympics, women were forbidden to be athletes. They were only r allowed to ride horses. Similarly, at the first modern games in 1896, only men competed. Bjorn de Coubertin thought that include women would be unimpractical uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. Women, however, got a chance to compete at the 1900 Games, showing the world that women were real competitors. Of course, the Olympics could be subverted for political ends. The, game, the 1936 Games in Berlin were used by the Nazis to show their ideas of superiority. While always with an eye for spectacle, the Nazis introduced the idea of a torch relay and lighted a flame. The same Olympics allowed Jesse Owens to win four gold medals and showed that Nazi racial ideas were nothing but inventions to make them feel better about themselves. Interesting. Number one, Prince Frederick and the Cricket Ball. So, in 1751, Frederick was struck in the chest by a cricket ball. He, the heir to the throne, developed an abscess from the injury. When this burst internally, he quickly became ill and died. That was a cause of death report at the time, and the story of the cricket ball is used, still used in academic newspapers. However, those considered Frederick to have died of a 
pneumonia unrelated to his injuries. Alright guys, that's it. Subscribe to my channel, like this video, and see you guys next time.